Professor Hiro Ida is Professor of Journalism and Intellectual History at School of Global Studies and Collaboration, Aoyama Gakuen University in Tokyo. He is also a contributing editor for Japan's Kyoto News in Tokyo and an editorial board member of the American Interest Magazine in Washington, D.C., where he has written highly regarded articles on American foreign policy past and present. He has authored four popular books in Japanese, three of them on America. Their titles in English are America in Disarray, 2017, The Trump Phenomena and American Conservative Thought, 2016, and In Pursuit of American Writers, revised publication 2016, and Who Starts War, 1994. He has also translated into Japanese books of influential American scholars, including Michigan's own Russell Kirk and Stanford University's Francis Fukuyama. His translation of Kirk was published with one of the oldest and most prestigious publishers in Japan. At Kyoto News, he has served as columnist, chief editorial writer, chief senior writer, and bureau chief in both Washington and Geneva, and has been contributing writer for a number of major Japanese magazines. He has been a visiting professor at Kansai University in Osaka and a research associate at the Center for Interdisciplinary Study of Monotheistic Religions at Doshisha University in Kyoto and as a guest lecturer at prestigious universities in Tokyo while working as a journalist. Professor Ida is a graduate of Tokyo University uh, of Foreign Studies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hiro Ida. Hi, Graham. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, this is the first time for me to come to this university, but it's a long time invitation by Graham. And eventually, the Japan Foundation decided to fund this uh, lecture, so I'm very glad to be here. And actually, uh, he and his daughter, Rebecca, <laughs> uh, came to my place uh, almost 10 years ago and had a uh, 10, what, 20, 2010, 2011 was that? And uh, they, yeah, 11, yes. And they had, uh, they traveled around Japan. And anyway, we have a long time friendship uh, uh, because of the Russell Kirk Center here in Michigan. And uh, both of us are kind of members of the events there at the Russell Kirk Center. And uh, well, you have a nice uh, campus, although I'm now competing with that what, pep, pep, pep competition. I don't know what it is. It's something about the football, I guess. And uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, this campus uh, looks like a campus of a Japanese uh, famous university, uh, International Christian University, which started in 1950s. And I just wondering why does I feel some kind of similarity between these two universities. And it smacks over, well, something about golfing. I don't know why. And it's, it, it, it looks to me it, it, it may have something about golf and uh, golfing. And uh, why is that? It started in 1950s. And it, it, those two sta uh, universities started in the Eisenhower years. And you know that? The Russell Cox said when a, a, uh, the, the Joe McCarthy, uh, the, the notorious or famous uh, you know, anti-communist senator, uh, once said, Eisenhower is a communist. And then the Russell Cox said, no, he's not a communist. He's just a golfer. <laughs> and uh, well, so uh, this university started and uh, the administration of a uh, golfing present. And uh, so that may be the reason why also that uh, Japanese university, International Christian University, also started in uh, mid-1950s uh, when Eisenhower was uh, present here. And uh, anyway, so it's, it's about you have a wonderful campus here. And uh, but, uh, well, uh, those I mean, international Christian universities also have a strong Christian, I mean, American connection. It mainly started by uh, American missionaries in Tokyo after the World War II. 
And uh, there is long standing good relations between US and Japan, uh, not only after the World War II, but uh, throughout the modern history. So today I'm going to tell you uh, about uh, those relation, relations between the United States and Japan in the modern history. It was originally titled Japan and America in the modern history, but I want to tell you also about the current status of our relations. So I, I just slightly changed uh, the title Japan and America in the modern world. And uh, well, first, where we are, because you know some Japanese students don't know, my students don't know, where is the United States, where is Canada, where is Mexico, and I just want to make sure that US is there and Japan is here. And uh, well, basically it's the United States is far west. Japan is in the far east. Well, you can say in French, the far east is uh, Orient extreme, so extreme Orient and extreme Occident. And the US is extreme Occident, extreme West. And uh, Japan is in the extreme far, far away East. And these two countries met about 160 years ago. And they became very close for a long time. There was a wartime. They became enemies for a short period. But basically throughout the modern age, these two extremes became so close. I'm telling you the story about that. And uh, well, this is a, 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 a slightly different theme. This is about the views of uh, different countries, about the image of other countries, and basically about the influence. Is certain country, A or B country, is giving you a good positive influence or bad negative influence. And the BBC is doing this every year. And uh, well, this is the average of, as it says, 2014 and 2017. And the most, the country which people think all over the world think are giving the world a very positive influence is at the top, Canada, and the second, Germany, and the third, Japan and France and UK. Those are the countries, people all over the world, thinking, giving the world positive influence. And uh, well, about seven or eight years ago, Japan was at the top. So those top five countries never changes. It's just their, their order may change, but a num the Canada, Germany, Japan, France, UK, those people think all over the world. Those are countries giving positive influence to the world. Unfortunately, US is, people don't think, giving a good positive influence, but uh, I don't know why people think Japan is giving a positive influence, but uh, that's an that's impression of the people all over the world. BBC is doing this every year, and uh, so just think about, this is a world perception, worldwide perception uh, Japan, about Japan. And, uh, but the people who are living in Japan, Japanese people, are thinking, uh, as for US, we are always thinking or viewing the United States in a very positive way. Look at this. This is by Pew Research Center, American, well, the research center. And they have been doing this many, many years. And all through, Japanese are having about positive views. That's a green one. Uh, well, almost 70 or sometimes 80 percent of Japanese people are having favorable, positive view of the United States, despite the other parts of the world made different views. Japanese, who are considered to be a, a very positively by the world, is thinking U.S. is a best country for us. We have all through. It's not only in the post-World War II situation. Almost all through the modern history, Japanese are looking at Americans in a very favorable, positive way. It's the same the other way around. 
This is a poll taken by Nielsen, American company. Uh, well, uh, uh, asked by the Gaimen Show. Gaimen Show means Japanese Foreign Ministry. And they have been doing this all through uh, many, many years. And uh, this is about J the American perception about Japan. Is Japan a dependable partner? As for a opinion leaders, red one, it's always recently. 90% of American opinion leaders consider Japan as a very dependable country or people. And uh, green, I mean, blue one is uh, just general population, common citizens. Their evaluation of Japan was low in 60s, 70s, but after well, maybe 90s or maybe 2000, their view, for favorable view about Japan is rising all through, and it's now 80%. So basically, opinion leaders, professors, journalists, or uh, company executives, they have a very positive view about Japan, and also the general population is now having more, more General, uh, general situation, I mean general population, uh, has, a, has a positive view of Japan. And that's the way. And this is about who is the most important partner in Asia. Uh, this is also a, a Nielsen, you know, the research. And uh, the blue line is Japan. So it's always Japan among Asian powers and uh, including Russia, uh, U.S. considers. Japan is a top partner, important partner in Asia. That's a American view. So that's the current situation of our perception, which developed throughout the modern age, and uh, except the war years. And this is about, well, the economic situation now. It's not about the perception, this is the reality. And uh, this is the GDP of uh, three countries, US, Japan, and uh, uh, China. And you can see, of course, US is always at the top. But now China is rising. As you can see, yellow line is uh, China. Japan is a red line. So in around 90s, Japan was so close to the United States, almost half or more than half. 60% of the US GDP, despite the population is a half, uh, the Japan had almost 60% of the US economy. And now China is rising, and China is getting close to the 60% of the US economy now, and uh, Japan is uh, maybe one third or less than that now. So this is, as far as GDP is concerned, US is always rising, and China is advancing on that, and uh, Japan is stagnating. This is true, and uh, this is the economic situation. And you see that the President Trump is now trying to make a deal with uh, China, because on the right-hand side, you can see the situation of the trade, of uh, US trade deficit in goods. The 40% of that is by China. Japan is maybe just several percent. But 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, sorry, uh, 1987, when US and Japan had a so-called trade frictions, Japan was in the place of China. Oh, if you look at the, the growth of our GDP, you can understand this. So Japan was a, a country which had a huge trade surplus with the United States, but now, it's China. So I remember that I was based in the United States in late 80s and 90s as a journalist, uh, early 90s. And uh, in those years, I found out that uh, a, a book was published, which was titled Coming War with Japan. That was the title of the book. And when I came back to the United States uh, in 2002, I just went to a bookstore and just looked around the shelves of the bookstores and uh, 
found out a book which was titled Coming Conflict with China. That's the perception of Americans. Americans felt we may have a war with Japan soon in the 80s, but in 2000, that perception has changed. Uh, the Americans thought, well, we may have a, a, a war with China. And, uh, but it's about the trade. Why we are so close? It's not a trade anymore. Is Japan-US relationship economically is getting weak? Not at all. It's much stronger. You know that because of investment. If you look at the so-called foreign direct investment, Japan is the third largest country. Those are the countries which are really close to the United States economically. UK, Canada, Japan, Germany, those are the countries which are investing a huge, huge amount of money to make factories or uh, to start new business everywhere here in the United States. And uh, the other four are Ireland, France, Switzerland, Netherlands. Those eight countries are investing almost 75, 80% of whole foreign direct investment here. Those countries are real close countries economically to the United States. You know why? Because Jap Japanese stopped exporting things to the United States and instead they started factories, businesses here and to employ Americans as workers while they let Americans do new businesses here in the United States and they are giving money or investing money to that. That's what we are doing now. We don't do, so for example, I myself is driving Subaru out back in Japan. It's Japanese made Subaru. But Subaru is ma making, manufacturing far less number of Subaru cars in Japan than here in the United States. I think maybe three, four times bigger number of Subaru cars are being manufactured here. And Honda also. More Honda cars are being made here. And, or basically outside of, the, outside of Japan, here or Southeast Asia or uh, you in Europe. So that's a globalized world. It's not trade, it's investment. And uh, here you can see those, the, the investing countries, UK, Japan, Germany, Canada, how many jobs they are producing here. And it's not much on merchandise. It says bringing jobs here. And Japan is bringing this number, 902.1 thousand workers, U.S. workers are working in, in Japan invested businesses. And this is the situation of uh, U.S.-Japan relations now. And uh, it's about investment. And we so talked about trade and we talked about this uh, well, investment. And now it is about a, 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 the security situation. I mean the defense and uh, those are, this shows the number of US bases all over the world. US has uh, bases almost all, maybe 100, more than 100 countries all over the uh, world. And Japan and Europe, Japan, Korea and Europe, they are hosting most of the US bases because of the situation of the world and because we are allies. So basically it's the West Europe, Western Europe and Japan which are supporting American whole security system and the international power security system here. So that's another thing. And uh, this shows how Japanese are supporting US forces in Japan and uh, Japanese are 
paying the 75 percent of uh, this is outside of the soldier's salary. Japanese are paying other things, you know, 75 percent, and South Koreans, Germans, Italians are doing that also, but Japanese are well just donating a lot more money to Americans and supporting American forces. So in terms of security, well, the network, American security network, Japan is supporting a, a Americans more than other allies. So that's the situation. So how did it start? So this is a history part. Have you ever heard of Commodore Matthew Perry? So he was, well, the visiting, he visited Japan in 1853. And he, well, basically made Japan open up to the world. And, uh, well, I said the extreme west and the extreme east uh, uh, met in, in, in those years, uh, 1853 4. Uh, Commodore Perry came to Japan twice, and the uh, Japanese government, then Tokugawa Shogunate, decided to open up. And uh, there are a lot of stories about that. You know, the, the reason why the US wanted to Japan to open up, major thing, one of the major things was waiting. Oh, the Commodore Perry started from Norfolk, but he was born in the New England. And uh, New England was a base of American waiting. And have you ever read that the Moby Dick, Moby Dick, you know, the famous uh, well, classical American novel, I read that in Japanese because in English it's so difficult. But uh, you know, it's 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 a crazy difficult book. You know, <laughs> you open it up. It's like an encyclopedia about whales. And, uh, <laughs> it's really true. You know that. And uh, but it says uh, quite a lot about Japan. And I don't say a lot, but there appears Japan. And because American wedding boat was sailing around Japan in those days. And they needed food, water, or uh, all those fuels for, for, for their wedding boats. And uh, so they needed a outpost in Far East. And they wanted to Japan work as, uh, to help uh, uh, those wedding boats from the United States. And so that was uh, one of the main reasons why. And, but even in those days, I think American final, eventual target was Chinese market. And Japan was also important for their wedding business. But look at this, uh, you know, the, the route taken by Commodore Perry. Uh, I thought when I was in, in, in young days, Commodore Perry from the American continent to across the Pacific Ocean to Japan, no, he came through southern tip of Africa, you know, Cape Town. And uh, so he made the longest route to Japan. If he could go through Panama Canal, it, wa it wasn't there in those days. Uh, but if you could cross the Pacific Ocean, you know, he didn't took, take so many, so many days to reach Japan, but it must have been a very long trip or voyage for him to arrive to Japan. And before, before, before Tokyo, he just dropped by in Shanghai and also to Okinawa. Okinawa was, in those days, a, a semi-independent a, a entity, those days. And uh, anyway, so this was Commodore Perry. And uh, on the right hand, this is a real, his, his photo. And on the left hand side, this is how we perceived Japanese people perceived Commodore Perry is. And, uh, well, this is about perception. And uh, they felt <laughs> he looks like uh, maybe a kind of monster. And uh, anyway, so this is also about our perception. This is from the MITs. They have a huge program about the visual perceptions of Japan and the US. 
and this is from their collection. And on the left hand side, you can see how Japanese saw it. All those samurai soldiers are in a disarray in a way, you know, they are so panicked. And they, but in those days, of course, Japan already had cannons and all those modern, you know, the weapons, but still, they, most of them, or the particular leadership understood the range is different. They could see the black ship of a, a red by Commodore Perry, and they saw their cannons, and instantly found out that the range is much longer. So they understood that city of Edo, it is Tokyo now, could be destroyed instantly by those, the four ships, and the Commodore Perry's fleet. And so that brought about a, a change of Japanese thinking. We have to change the things, and we have to get modernized. We have to get industrialized. On the right-hand side, this is a perception of the US, part of the perception of the United States. This was the dinner given on the, the, the Pohatan. That's the, the flagship of the fleet. And you can see the big, you know, the cannon there. And Japanese could see that, and they could compare the difference, uh, or see the difference. So, so in Japan, they are started a war, civil war, to change Japan. It is 1868-69 Boshin War in Japan, civil war, which brought about a, a change of the government, whole political system, and a Meiji Restoration, which started in 1868. Uh, there was a short war, and then Japanese modernization just started from there. And, uh, but it was not complete. There was so-called 1877 Satsuma Rebellion. Some of you have seen a movie titled Last Samurai. It is about this rebellion. This was a backlash towards against the modernization or change. And, but Japan was so decided about the modernization, so it went through, and the rebellion was, uh, well, failed. And same kind of process occurred in the United States, in my view. The 1861-65 Civil War, just after the Commodore Perry's visit, the war started in the United States, Civil War, in America. That was also about modernization. I would say Japan, in those years, mid 19th century was half modern, half feudal. Why Japan was modern in samurai days? It march and cross. It was peacetime for 250 years. And under that peacetime situation, Japanese march and cross, who are considered a lowest class in the Japanese political system, you know that four classes in, uh, under shogunate, samurai at the top, and farmers are second class. And the third class are artisans, because farmers and artisans are making things. But merchants are just trading things. So they considered, they are considered as lowest class. But this lowest class was the richest class around the end of the Tokugawa year, or even from the beginning they are getting richer and richer and richer. And peacetime is a great thing because it's a peacetime economy prospered, or there are up and ups and downs, but still they invented a lot of things. The most important one is futures trading. Even in 18th century, Japanese futures trading, trading the future. I mean, it's not about merchandise, they traded the future crops or future products. And basically it's about rice. Future crops, rice crops. It was transacted in a huge amount in Japan. It's just papers. And now you know, you know that Chicago 
the futures market. They learned a lot from Japanese, actually Osaka, futures market of rice, which started in 18th century. In those days, there are two major futures markets in the world, one in Osaka. The other one is in Amsterdam, Dutch. They were doing the futures transaction of tulips. And Japan are doing this huge futures transaction of uh, rice crops of the future, next year or the, the year after the next. And it's a long story about why it started. It's uh, uh, partly about ethics and partly about entrepreneurship. And maybe later we can go to that. But Japanese capitalism was matured already in the 18th century. And that continued. That produced banking system, postal system, all those kind of things. So Japanese capital, capitalist system was really matured, complete, pretty modern. And the merchant class prospered. And that was also the cause of this political change. It's not only by the pressures outside Japan, mainly by the United States, but even inside the system was not sustainable. Political system was not sustainable anymore. And uh, it's the same with the United States. Mid 19th century, you still had slavery in the South. It was a feudal system, class society. Half of the United States was not modern at all. But Lincoln appeared and he decided to make this country fully modern, industrialized. So he thought slavery should be abolished and the southern part should be incorporated with the industrialized north. And let's get this country fully modernized. That was the meaning of what happened in mid-19th century here in the United States and there in Japan. And there was also a backlash. You had a re reconstruction period. It wasn't complete. The southern ideas remained. And some of them are good because, you know, everything wasn't bad about the old system. There are some positive things and, uh, well, one of them is traditional a kind of family, sense of family, community, or, uh, well, order, all those things, you know. Or loyalty, honor, all those values are feudal, old values. They have their values, but uh, you know, there's a, some kind of conflict with the modern system. Anyway, so there was a backlash, and backlash was there, and but still, Modernity progressed after 1877. So you could see the similarities of modernization process of Japan and the US there. And how did it develop? Look at this. It was still, Japan was 20 years behind technologically, but it will catch up soon. For example, this is about railroads. East and West, shaking hands, May 10th, 1869. So you had transcontinental railway system. In 1869, Japan also started building railways all over Japan. And finally, 1889, 20 years after, the East and West inside Japan connected. Tokyo and Kobe, railway lines from these two major cities were connected in the middle, and it was completed. So Japan became more whole and unified by railways, and the U.S. also. You may think, you know, length was so different. You know, the U.S., it, it may be like, uh, well, in kilometer terms, you know, 4,000 kilometers. In the case of Japan, it's like a 500, 600 kilometers, but it's mountainous country, technologically. It may be as difficult as in the case of the United States to connect the railways in this uh, plain, the whole plain of the United States. There are Rocky Mountains also, 
But in the case of Japan, to connect Kobe and Tokyo means you have to make a lot of long tunnels and you have to overcome this mountainous landscape or uh, uh, the, yeah. That, that, so this is about the railway and if you look at the telephone system, Japan is almost now 10 years closer. And uh, well, Bell Place, well first, the regional uh, telephone service op opened in New Haven, Connecticut, 1879. In the case of Japan, Tokyo, Yokohama was connected by telephone service, started uh, 10 years after from that. And uh, well, uh, the 10 years after that, uh, well, around that time Japan uh, connected Tokyo, Yokohama, US started New York, Chicago uh, telephone call system. And so Japan was catching up very fast and the modernization system. But those, this means industrialized Japan, industrialized US, and we had same kind of problems. The, a kind of a cruel capitalism. And uh, this is on the right hand side, a left hand side, you see the overbearing trust in America, caricatured in the newspaper cartoon. And around the same time, there was uh, this kind of newspaper cartoon or uh, uh, printed by, this is not a magazine, I think not a newspaper, it's a magazine. And uh, so we felt we have a same kind of pro problem with, uh, with a rampant capitalistic system is uh, making people worried and uh, people felt oppressed by the, the those, you know, the, the money changers or in the case of the United States, it's still oil and uh, those, you know, copper trusts. And uh, in the case of Japan, also mining industry was prospered and uh, there was already a huge, uh, the pollution problems and uh, so, we suffered a, and understood we have the same kind of problems and separately we are trying to sort out those things. And labor unions started in Japan and also in the case of the United States, the People's Party started and the populist movement. And anyway, around the turn of the century, we already had the same kind of problems in terms of our capitalism. And on the other hand, spiritually, people. There was a spiritual dilemma there also. What is this modernity? What is this industrialization? And the intellectuals felt a, a dilemma there. In the case of the United States, Mark Twain wrote those stories of adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And basically, he said something about you are missing was something about you lost. In the case of Japan, our greatest modern novelist, Natsume Soseki, wrote a dozens of novels, all of them about, about this dilemma, or intellectual dilemma of modernity. And if you read, for example, translation of one of the most popular books, novels written by, it's very short. A, a, by Soseki, Natsume Soseki. It is Bochan. It is something like Huckleberry Finn. And it's about a young teacher who went to a local middle school. And it's a, it's a funny story, but eventually you, felt, you feel this is about something we lost. We lost. We have lost something. And there are many great stories. And Mark Twain also. So, and they lived almost in the, uh, they wrote stories almost in the same period, I think. And, uh, but still, the modernization is going on. And uh, you can see similarities here also. Uh, this is two wars, Japan and uh, US decided to fight against old empires. In the case of the United States, it's a Spanish, old, ancient, but declining empire, Spanish empire. And uh, you fought 1898, Spanish-American war. And Japan fought 
a war against Qing Dynasty of China, old empire. And those two wars made a debut of these two young modern nations as a new empires competing with the British Empire, French Empire, or latecomers such as Germans and Italians. So there started modern competition over old empires and a new, new old empires like uh, French and the British and real new empires like Japan, US, and uh, uh, Germany and Italy. And Japan and US really did the same kind of debut fighting against old empires around the same time. Japan fought a war, 1894-5, Sino-Japanese War, and US fought a 1898 Spanish-American War. Those wars made these countries seen differently from the other parts of the world. And the people started considering the power of Japanese empire and American empire on the other hand. So there's a kind of a simultaneous, a, a start of a new empires in 1890s. And uh, another big thing for Japan and US was this Boxers Rebellion in China. And uh, there, the eight nations protected a, their, their delegations in Beijing. And it became a famous movie, movie titled uh, The 55 Days in Peking. And that's an old movie, but it's a good movie, interesting movie about Boxers Rebellion. And uh, those are the soldiers from eight nations which protected the city of Beijing. Uh, well, actually, their delegations, the uh, diplomatic delegations in Beijing. And uh, they succeeded in protecting. And it, it became a movie later. And uh, those are the, on the second from the left is American soldier. On the right hand side, you can see Japanese soldier. Very short, small. But later, Lee Kuan Yew, the famous uh, uh, the Singapore prime minister said, during the World War II, later he reminisced. I didn't understand why Japanese are so strong, so short compared to British. They, the, their size is half of the Brits. And he thought the British, you know, the, the, the domination of the world will never, never end. But Japanese came and smaller Japanese soldiers just defeated whole British army in Malay Peninsula. And so he was so short. And uh, anyway, but with this, the Japanese had the largest the, the expeditionary troops there. And they, they were the main heroes of the boxers, fight against the boxers' rebellion. And that brought about this famous Anglo-British alliance. And on the left-hand side, this is a kind of, a, well, the celebrative, uh, you know, the uh, mentality of the Brits in those days, because it was the only and the first alliance British Empire made with a whole foreign country, and it was with Japan. And it, it was a, well, Japanese thought it was a, a pride of Japan, but they knew the reality on the right-hand side, why Brits wanted a alliance with us because they want us to fight against Russians. This cartoon is carried by Japanese media and uh, the Russians on the right hand side, a left hand side, is cooking Korea and the Americans and the Brits are asking Japanese to just stop him and get him and just defeat him. And uh, so we are we fought this Russo-Japanese war on, on behalf of US and uh, British Empire. And because they were so worried about the progress of Russia to the south 
in, in Asian continent as a whole. And so, well, we ha I have to end. This is about the Russo-Japanese War. Unfortunately, it was fought not in Japan, Russia, but over China and Korea. Mm -hmm. So we made a lot of problems, so caused a lot of troubles to those peoples. But uh, it was empire, uh, I mean, the competition among empires. And on the right hand side, left hand side, you see a Japanese cavalry fought back the world famous Cossacks. The Europeans couldn't believe that. They thought Cossacks are the strongest cavalry in the world, but Japanese fought them back over the uh, Yalu River, which is the border of Korea and uh, China. And there, Japanese fought in other, other people's countries and the soils. And uh, the, the right-hand side, this is a famous Battle of Tsushima. This just, uh, well, the made Japanese again as a, a, a great country in, in terms of the empire competition. And the Battle of Tsushima was complete victory over Russia's fleet, which they sent from, from, from European uh, waters and uh, so with this, Japanese already destroyed the Russia's Asian fleet, and uh, they decided to send a European fleet to Asia to to destroy whole Japanese navy. But in, on, it was on the contrary, Japanese destroyed whole European Russian fleet, and. Uh, this was really a, a historical victory in a naval history. And uh, so this was a Russo Japanese, but Russo Japanese War, actually, Japan might not have won without a mediation by Theodore Roosevelt. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt mediated between Russia and Japan when Japan was winning. And uh, Russia has had their own domestic problems. Already there was a lot of discontent about uh, Russia's Tsar system, old system, and it eventually led to the communist revolution uh, a little bit 10 years later. And, uh, but this is the Theodore Roosevelt decided because the problem for US and Brits were the southern advance of uh, Russia to Asia. They thought Japanese might be better to help them out. And uh, so Theodore Roosevelt just mediated this uh, Russo-Japanese war. And when, while Japanese were winning, this peace treaty was signed. And so ja it was Japanese victory but Russia didn't spend whole their army or navy power yet. And uh, so it was a very clever move by Theodore Roosevelt, but that was triggered by a friendship between Roosevelt and Japanese politicians. It's a, it's a long story, and the Japanese were smart enough to persuade Theodore Roosevelt to, to, to do this. And so you see how close US-Japan relations up until these days. And, uh, but people say this was the start of the confrontation between Japan and US. You couldn't have two major powers in this Pacific area. And uh, eventually, Japan tried to control whole Pacific Ocean and collided with the United States. But still, uh, that happens much later. And uh, although Japan and the uh, US started, started seeing each other as rivals, but uh, during the World War I, they still cooperated to help Europeans. You don't know that. Japanese sent a fleet to the Mediterranean Sea from East Asia to Europe to assist Brits in the Mediterranean Sea to fight against the, the submarine 
you know, the operations of, uh, of, of the Germany. A famous, uh, you know, the U-boat started sinking many Allied forces, you know, the, the ships. And the Japanese went there to help uh, these anti-submarine operations of uh, Brits and others. And uh, so this is a famous uh, Japanese second special squadron. And the Japanese sent about, well, about 17 ships to the Mediterranean Sea. Well, it was a small, small amount, maybe, but it was a long way from Japan. And uh, on the way to the Mediterranean Sea, Japanese fleet carried Australian soldiers to European freight. And uh, just a uh, few years ago, there was a ceremony of that cooperation between Japan and Australia. And it was celebrated uh, at uh, some port in Australia where the, I think Prime Minister, of Australian Prime Minister came there to give, give a speech. And uh, so on the other hand, uh, the US sent, sent two million soldiers and uh, to, to European front. Although it was not a war of the United States, but uh, to help democratic world. Uh, but it's not only about democracy. It's also about the empire competitions. It's about a, 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 a money. It's about commercial. It's about business. And uh, so this is the situation of the World War II. But in those days, already, Japan and US was a, a, a kind of a rivals. And, uh, and during the World War II, Russia, there was a Russian revolution, and the Japanese also deployed on the request of the United States to save Czech soldiers in Siberia uh, who were isolated there. Uh, and uh, so uh, the Japanese sent troops there, Americans sent troops there. Those are the countries which sent troops to Siberia, Russia. And uh, it was a, a joint operation of Japan, US, and others. And so still very, very cooperative situation. And uh, maybe I'll finish in five minutes, sorry. And so eventually the Allied or uh, the powers won the war, and Japan was uh, part of that. And they joined this uh, famous uh, Versailles 1919 Paris Peace Conference. This year is 100th anniversary of that. And uh, this is a Japanese delegation. And there, you know that uh, the Woodrow Wilson proposed this uh, League of Nations. And there was a negotiation of peace treaty there. And Japanese proposed a specific clause about equality of races. And in the beginning, Wilson said, it's OK. It has something to do with the self-determination of countries or nations, nation states. But eventually, US and UK and others rejected that. And that was a big disappointment to Japanese. Uh, but there are reasons for Americans, I think, because the half-baked reconstruction, you know that the, in the southern part of the United States, it was still Jim Crow law system. And, uh, there was racial segregation still going on. So Wilson was a politician, and he was from Virginia. So if he says racial equality in the international system, that may bounce back to the domestic situation, I guess. So uh, there are many other reasons why Americans decided to reject Japanese proposal. And it was about the immigration problems. Japanese and Chinese agents are coming in a huge number to the US. So there are many other problems. And with those, Americans rejected Japanese proposal about the racial equality. That became a, one of the reasons why Japanese thought maybe Americans are not my, our friend. But still, up until 19, late 30s or early 40s, friendship continued. And there are many other cases, like uh, of friendships. Look at that uh, Potomac cherry tree, cherry blossom trees. It was given to the United States around this time, um, a little bit earlier than this. And I think there are two great international gifts 
in the United States. One is the Statue of Liberty in New York, and the other one is cherry blossom trees on Tyler Basin and the Potomac area. And, uh, so there was a friendship going on in business or in my business, journalism. You know, up until the war starts between Japan and US, the exchange of uh, journalists between US and Japan was so good. There's a wonderful story about New York Times and Asahi Shimbun, which has a long, long friendship. And uh, when war Pearl Harbor attack started, uh, the most of the Japanese in the United States decided to go back to Japan, or well, they were forced to go back to Japan. And at that time, New York Times president called up. They, Asahi Shimbun had a news bureau inside the New York Times building. And when Asahi Shimbun bureau staff decided to go back to Japan, the New York Times executives came to the office. We'll keep your office here. War will end soon. And you'll come back to this office. And after the World War II, several years after, the Asahi Shimbun decided to have a new office in New York again and asked New York Times, we are going to come back, so let us have an office there. OK, you come back. And they went back and found out that the same office was kept vacant for the Asashi Shimbun all throughout the war years. That kind of things happened between Japanese people and Americans, despite this tragic war. And there again started a, a cooperation between US and Japan. And it became, as I, shown, as I have shown to you in the first half of the presentation, close ties by investment. And uh, well, investment means you have to compromise your cultures. You have to understand other people's values. We are doing that. And we are merging in that term, you know, values, cultures. So that what has been going on throughout 150, 60 years since the black ships came over to Japan and surprised Japanese, and the Japanese and Americans decided to get fully modernized in mid-18th century. How similar we are. That's the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you very much. We're going to do Q&A, and you have a couple of options. So I have this mic, and if you raise your hand, I'll bring you the mic, and you're in charge. OK, so that's one option. Another option is we have three by five cards and small pieces of notepad paper. And if you raise your hand, um, we have uh, a couple students who will hand you one of those uh, one of those cards, and you can ask your question, and uh, it'll get brought to me, and uh, I can ask your question for you. But ideally, uh, you're welcome to ask questions from the floor. So I think I saw a hand up. Yep. All right. You just have to wait for me to uh, mosey. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That was a very insightful lecture. I lived in Japan for three years for mm -hmm. the Dow Chemical Company in Yokohama, right. so it was right. nice to hear that too. One of my questions is, I understand that uh, at the onset of the Meiji Restoration, mm -hmm. Emperor Meiji was only 16 or 17 years old. Right, right, right. And if that's true, how did this marvelous recovery and renovation and modernization occur yep. with a teenager, sorry everybody, <laughs> running the country? <laughs> he was not running the country at all. It was, you know, the. The Meiji Restoration was a revolution started by young samurai Turks from the southern western Japan, southwestern Japan. And uh, yeah, is it okay? No. Uh, sorry. Was it too loud? Was it too loud? No, I just can't. You cannot hear? Originally, he was mic from the podium, but now, in theory, the whole mic is on. But you're saying you can't hear it. You cannot hear? OK. So it was not the emperor himself who was running. Emperor was 
in a way used because the meaning of the Meiji restoration, it was not a rest, of course it was a restoration of the, not power of the emperor, but basically it was a revolution done by the revolutionaries or uh, innovators, young samurai from southwestern Japan. And they put the emperor at the top, but it was basically oligarch, oligarchy by those innovators from the southwestern Japan. And they formed oligarchy. So there was a friction between the former samurai class of the other parts of the country and domination of the southwestern power. So it's the other way around. The, in the case of the civil war of the United States, North overwhelmed or, or prevailed over the South. In the case of Japan, South prevailed over a, a, a Northern Japan. So Northern Japan, after the major uh, uh, restoration, was segregated economically. And so that's why Japanese North is underdeveloped compared to the other part of Japan. So anyway, it was an oligarch system, an oligarchy. And uh, so, but the, the early leaders in Meiji period knew that system. So it was pretty much like a British system. Emperor was there, but actual power resided with the aristocrats or others. And uh, so, but slowly, slowly, people started forgetting about that. And uh, uh, well, at some point, the Meiji oligarchs made emperor like a god. They put emperor or tried to use emperor as a god to 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 overwhelm the people, common people. And so that was a one mistake. Of, and there are many other mistakes uh, done by Meiji oligarchs. But early Meiji oligarchs knew that this is just a system. So emperor is there, and he is a nominal head. Actual thing is being done by, as you said, those people under him. So that's about it. Do you think on. Yeah. Do you see relations with the United States and Japan to continue to be prosperous, or is there anything that could falter these, you know, this alliance they have together? Uh, do you mean the U.S.-Japan alliance is? Uh, like, do you think do you see relations continuing to be to be good, or could anything mess that up? In the uh, I think you know it's it's a kind of a natural. It seems to be very natural alliance. You know that uh, you know. You know, the, the Anglo-American alliance, you think you take it very natural thing. But throughout the 19th century, the arch enemy of US was Brits. You know that. You fought against Brits in uh, late 18th century. And the Brits came back 1812. And the, the US Civil War was actually war between not, between, not only between north and south of the United States, but it was south was provider of cotton to the textile industry of UK. So it was a controlled, the south was economically controlled by UK empire industrial system. And that was the Lincoln wanted to end that. And he wanted to incorporate totally the southern part of the United States into the industrialized modern US. So there was a, 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 a kind, of, kind of a, you know, the enemy situation between UK and US, but still because of other reasons, slowly you became a strong allies around the turn of the century from eight, uh, 19th to 12th. And uh, Japan had a long process also so I would say US-Japan relationship is very similar to, in a way, 
there was a time lag, but uh, something like uh, US-UK relationships. And uh, for me, there are a lot of differences. I I'm not so optimistic about this. There are a lot of differences between us. But still, look at the whole world history. We are so close. So, so if you look at the, you know, the, the other kind of map, or the US at the center, American-centric map, you could see that. UK and Japan on the periphery of continents, and they are, both of them, have strong ties with the United States across two oceans. And uh, that's a kind of a very natural phase of a world system in some way or other. And it may continue for, for a long time, I guess, because it lasted for a long time. Uh, I think so. I'm, I'm, I may be very optimistic, but uh, some people say China could be a good ally of the United States eventually. I don't know. Maybe. What kind of American president you wish to be elected uh, <laughs> next year? Good for next year. US, good for Japan, good for the world? Well, basically, you know, the, I would say, you know, it's, you, if you say you as a plural, not only me, but as a as whole Japanese uh, population, strangely enough, Japanese like Republican presidents since uh, maybe since Reagan days. So over the last uh, 30, 40 years, Japanese like Republicans all through. So Trump is very different, but still there are many leadership people who are supporting Republicans. But on the other side, a hand, you know, intellectuals in Japan are supporting Democrats rather. So there's always a conflict inside Japan, but uh, in, in terms of the practical politics, Japanese leadership is always, over the last 40 years, the Republicans. Because Republicans, Trump is different, but uh, free trade, and uh, that's important. And uh, this so-called liberal international order, supported by strong US forces and uh, US allies. That's the, 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 the kind of uh, ideal world system for Japan for the time being. So US-led liberal international order based upon free trade idea and supported the system supported by the US-centered alliance system as a US at the center. And uh, because the, uh, uh, and at the core of that is ideas and uh, the free trade or freedom, democracy, all those basic ideas and uh, values, those values are the same. So Japanese want the, the, the leadership which may have more strong emphasis on those values and uh, this system based upon those values. So I don't know who Japanese want to have a president uh, next year, because uh, US, as I wrote in my final book in Japanese, uh, maybe I'm going to write another book next year, the US system is in disarray now. They are very much confused. and. Uh, in terms of values and uh, political system. So we have to look at those, what's happening in the United States in, uh, in very carefully. And uh, so that's uh, uh, the uh, situation now. So we cannot say easily which president uh, or a president from which country, uh, which party would be better for Japan. Uh, we don't know yet, I think. Maybe it's not a good question. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, how do you understand there is a no prime and friend, only prime and interest? No, no what? Just the no prime and friends, only prime and interest. I don't understand, yeah? Sorry. That's wrong. <laughs> no, no permanent friends. Oh, sorry. Oh, permanent friends for what? Oh, so the 
expression is no permanent friends, only permanent interests. Ah, <laughs> that's a famous phrase, yeah. No, you know, so it's, you know, that's what British says, British says, you know, it's, uh, it's always interest. It's, there's always permanent interest. And uh, maybe true, maybe true, but I, I think it's not only, it's not everything. Because that means it's, it's a realistic idea. I know that, you know, Brits are very realistic. And uh, British diplomacy is always, well, it's based upon national interests. It's true. But what is national interest? It's only about money? It's only about business? I don't think so. It's more something. Your national interests depend upon also on values, your cultures, your ideas. So if you include, when you say interests, permanent interests, your permanent, how should I say, values, or your values, well, it may be true, but if it means only about business interests, economic interests. I don't think so. It's not true. I don't. I don't think it's not true, and uh, it's it's just cynical way of saying about the diplomacy or the world system. Well, it seems like everything seems to be based upon the economic interests. Look at what happened between U.S. and Japan. It was open door diplomacy of US, John Hay, the, the, the Theodore Roosevelt days, or McKinley days, you know, the, uh, the early 20th century, US had a famous uh, Secretary of State, uh, John Hay, and his China policy was open door policy. It looks like a, a, about economic interests, and uh, that brought about the crash between Japan and uh, US eventually, but is that open door policy ju it was just about a business interest. Openness is value. It was about values. And also, it was about, it was also power. But uh, so when US asked for commercial interest, it seems like US is just asking for a commercial interest. And there was such kind of view about the United States in 1920s and 30s in Japan. And US is greedy. US are always asking for business interests. And, but that was partly true, but it, it was misunderstanding of US. US wanted, to, wanted China to open up, not only for commercial interests, but undercurrent was they wanted to open society. They wanted democracy, freedom. Openness meant that also. And so open door policy sound, sounded like a for commercial purposes. But uh, the US well, psyche was not always focusing about commercial interests. It's also without knowing about those open system or values. So, well, permanent interest is the, you know, that's the only thing about the world system. Maybe if you include interest of your values also, I think. That's my, that's my answer. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, you had mentioned that as Japan had demonstrated its, its will to assert itself in Asia against Russia, yeah. this was the beginning of tension with the United States. Do you see a parallel with China? No. Yeah. And what role does Japan play in those? And That's I'll just make it a little more complicated. Especially yeah, if Article 19, yeah, nine, Article nine, nine, excuse me, yeah. is changed so that Japan can begin military operations mm. abroad. That's a very big question. I know Chinese are smart enough, and uh, they are, there's a lot of consultations between China and Japan about how to avoid 
Japanese experience. Japanese are open-minded about it. And uh, it, it's mainly about what happened in 1980s. Japanese economy was growing so fast in 70s, 80s, just like China now. And uh, there happened a compromise between Japan and the US about monetary system. You know that famous Plaza Accord and Japanese cut down the, the well, uh, the US decided to cut down the, the value of dollar vis-a-vis -vis yen, Japanese yen, and Japanese went, yen went up, and that was a artificially, you know, made decision between Japanese leadership and US to sort out this huge trade deficit problem. But that caused the bubble burst, the, the, the collapse of the bubble economy in Japan later, and the Chinese knew that, Chinese don't like to have that, and there's a lot of a advice going from Japanese leadership to China. This might have been a mistake for us, but you may do a different kind of things. There are, Chinese are coming to Japan and asking for, I, we'd like to learn from your mistakes. They are so open-minded, just, like just like Japanese. So first we have to sort out the economic issues. It's now like a fight now between China and the US, and you have to sort this out. If you can do that, then you can avoid the next kind of confrontation. So the one important thing is just sort out current the economic conflict or business conflict or monetary conflict between US and Japan, I mean US and China. And there was a experience of Japan, so you may use that if you, both of you, have a clever, you know, readerships on both sides. There's a lot of things you can learn. And if you put that in the early 20th century context, it was also commercial, commercial conflicts over China, Japan and the US. Both of them wanted a more profits from this huge market called China. But uh, US decided to support Japan in the beginning to fight against Russia's control, not only over Korea, that means northeastern China. And uh, US and UK, was, well, they were so afraid of Russian control over northeastern China, including, in a way, this Korean Peninsula. So that was the reason why they asked Japan to fight against Russia, because we thought it was strategic interest for us to have a control over Korean Peninsula. That was their mind in those days. So it's an empire competition. So it was, it, but it started basically about the commercial interests or colonial interests. And uh, Japanese won, and Japanese started having a, a, a kind of a control over North Eastern China. Eventually, in later, Japanese invaded there and had a, a puppet country. And uh, so it started as a commercial competition and uh, the Americans didn't like Japanese control over a North Eastern China and, uh, that, and uh, John Hay or other, uh, John Hay's idea was inherited uh, to other, the, the later administrations, open door policy. They asked open door policy, equal opportunities to everybody. And when Americans say equal opportunity, it means American advantage. Because in those days, America was the much stronger economy compared to others already. British Empire's economy was declining and it's so Germans and Japanese and Americans who are on the rise. And, but US was far ahead of others. So when you say open door, equal opportunities for everybody, that means US would win. 
And so that what Japanese didn't like. <laughs> and uh, so there was a conflict. So it started like that. So that means what I want to say is if you can sort out those issues of economic co competition, you can avoid the other kind of confrontation. So that's what we should do now, how to sort out this competition or uh, new kind of competition. Because in the globalized system, it's more complicated. You know, the Americans are feeling our jobs are deprived of us by Chinese. It's not true, it's half true, but uh, so how to sort that thing out? Have you ever seen that the famous uh, elephant chart? And uh, over the last 20 years, Chinese middle class expanded their, their income almost twice over the last 20 years, but the Chinese middle class. So Chinese middle class is now like our, just like us. And, uh, but US, Japanese, European middle class over the last 20 years didn't have any rise of the income over the last 20 years, the particularly lower middle class. And there's a famous chart about the incomes of the world. And uh, so Japanese lower middle class or American middle class or European middle class, many of them are thinking like this. We are suffering from this growth of developing countries. And that perception is making this confusion of uh, politics in advanced world. So it's very difficult uh, uh, problem to sort out. You, you may have to ask to developing countries to do something, because it's true that uh, middle class here is stagnating. And everybody should have a equal growth rate. And so, but the, the maybe Chinese, Indians, and others say, well, we can do that after we reached on the same level as you. So it, it may be also reasonable. So, so how to sort that the problem out? You know, this uh, huge gap of a growth of uh, income between developing countries and uh, developed world. So that's, that's the first thing I have to, we have to do. We have to sort out, I think. So there are many, many things before, before the militarization of Japan or all those things. Well, but as for militarization, I mean, it's not a militarization. We may have to uh, do more or share, burden sharing. And the Europeans decided to expand their the defense expenditures, and Japanese has, haven't done that yet as, as much as Europeans. So maybe first thing is we have to go on the same footing with Europeans, Western Europeans, and uh, how to help the US and uh, other allies to maintain this uh, free world system, I think, yeah, so. I just want to say, I've been telling students this uh, as they've been leaving, if you're looking for Excel credit, it's no longer a sign-in sheet. So if you're going to look for a sign-in sheet on your way out, don't. Uh, if you go on to Blackboard and you go into university departments, you'll find the place to get Excel credit. And I'm sure there's some university folks who will be happy to help you with that. But so I just want to tell you that on the way out. Uh, thank you again for coming, and please join me in thanking Professor thank Ida for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I, I defy any of you to uh, fight 12-hour jet lag within 48 <laughs> hours to give a lecture in Japan. <laughs> thank you.